weekend. It was a great weekend. I hope you had a great weekend. Had a chance to see some friends, had a chance to breathe some fresh air to let the sunlight hit my face. And of course, I've just been waiting to connect with all of you as yet another story out of our home province of Alberta has made national news uh, embarrassing about, well, four million of us and, and, and making a small handful of my fellow Albertans uh, probably pretty proud as punch. You know exactly what I'm talking about. The Canada's Deputy Prime Minister, Finance Minister Christian Freeland uh, accosted, verbally assaulted, in the front lobby of Grand Prairie City Hall as she was there for a meeting with Grand Prairie's Mayor Jackie Clayton. Her Worship, Mayor Clayton, will be joining me in about five, ten minutes' time. And I'm curious to talk to her about uh, those few moments after uh, Minister Freeland, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland, gets into the elevator. Her staff members, who remain remarkably calm through this entire ordeal, are sort of, uh, you know, um, with a small uh, sort of a, an evident sense of urgency, trying to get that door to close, hitting these buttons as this this big hulking uh, guy by the name of Elliot McDavid uh, screams obscenities at the deputy prime minister, drops the C bomb on her, a whole bunch of F bombs in front of uh, a bunch of people, uh, including strangers, and then some of his supporters. I don't know if it was his wife or girlfriend or, or whomever. Uh, they then, uh, Mr. McDavid and and his gaggle, head out into the parking lot and, and, and gleefully celebrate what they've just done, which is, is uh, physically and otherwise intimidate a federal minister, presumably under the assumption that it was going to have some impact on federal policy around vaccines or fertilizer or perhaps Canada's involvement with the World Economic Forum. Not exactly sure. This is the type of scenario where if you try to understand the logic behind something illogical, you will be sit, you will be stuck spinning your tires, uh, which is sort of maybe a little bit representative. That might uh, kind of describe how I've felt mentally over the past couple of days. I've been, I've been sitting, um, you know, in, in my own thoughts, and I've been paying attention to what others have been saying, and we're going to bring you some of those comments this morning, trying to figure out w- what you say about something like this. It's it's disturbing. It's horrific. It's ridiculous. It's embarrassing. It's damaging to Alberta's already battered and bruised reputation right now, and uh, and I figured that uh, there's no better place for us to talk this out and to share some of our thoughts and to speak plainly and to keep it real than right here on Real Talk. And so we'll have the voices of Mayor Clayton and Sturgeon County Mayor Alana Natch, who's going to join me a little bit later on in the show. Don't worry, I'll ask her about this Prairie Gardens fiasco, too. Uh, If you're not familiar with that, don't worry, we'll get you up to speed. Uh, It's a family business essentially saying the county's forcing them to close, and uh, we want to get, you know, the, the county's side of all this. And so we'll get into that. I also want to mention quickly, if you subscribe to our Real Talk Sunday message, the email that we send out every Sunday night, it's easy to subscribe. It's, of course, free. You just go to ryanjesperson.com. You scroll down to the bottom of the page. You can sign up there. Sunday nights, we let you know what's coming up on the show. And uh, we did have astrophysicist Katie Mack confirmed to join us today. That's because Artemis, this new NASA project, this is fascinating stuff, an unmanned uh, I mean, this is this is essentially humankind and NASA, the United States return to the moon. Uh, it starts as an unmanned mission, then it evolves with Artemis 2, Artemis 3. Super cool stuff. A lot of really neat scientific research going on. They were set for launch this morning. Uh, four engines. There was an issue with one of them. And so we've been in touch with Katie, and she's going to join us a little bit later on this week. Uh, we want to talk to her as they get closer to launch. It looks like our Artemis will go up Friday morning. We'll talk to Katie on Thursday. There is no episode of Real Talk on Friday, by the way, just letting you know. So Katie Mack, instead of today, like it said on our Sunday email, is going to join us coming up on Thursday morning. I'm assuming that there's not a lot of young kids tuned in this morning. If if, if you are assuming rightfully so that we're going to be talking about this incident in Grand Prairie, but this is my heads up to you. We are going to play this video just one time, only going to play about 15 seconds of it. We've cut out some of the stuff, but but this gives you a general idea. So so here's this guy, this goon that shows up. Um, I know that people don't, perf- well, we'll call it a tank top. He's wearing his, his ripped tank top. Uh, he's, he's got, you know, he's, he's kind of coming in there. He walks in and, and people are trying to figure out what he has on his belt. Johnny, I don't know if you saw on his belt. Some people say it's a cell phone. Some people say it's a buck knife yeah it looks like Uh, he's got something like a buck knife or something on his belt and he walks in and he kind of he's kind of one of these guys that kind of walks in and kind of barks with what he wants you know he walks in and he says to the people at the front hall you know the front uh, desk of city hall you know i need to know who's in charge i 
need to talk to who's in charge here. One of these guys with kind of this swagger, right? And as, and as he's being shown the politeness that would come with a front-facing employee at a city hall, uh, they're saying, well, my boss is out for lunch, but I couldn't. And then all of a sudden, in walks Christia Freeland with her team. Not with the security detail, by the way, but with her team, her staffers. And she's on her way to meet Mayor Clayton. And she's walking toward the elevator. And this woman, I don't know if she's been identified or not, the woman that was with Elliot McDavid, you'll hear her. She says, there she is. There's Christia. And and then it unfolds. So here it is. Here's what we're talking about. Here's a portion of this video that was pushed out this weekend from Grand Prairie. Right. That's Christia. Christia. Yes. The fuck are you doing in Alberta? You fucking traitor, fucking bitch. Get the fuck out of this province. You don't belong here. Yeah, you don't belong here. First of all, she's from Peace River, north of Grand Prairie, so fuck <laughs> off. Uh, you don't belong here. But, you know, what are you doing in Alberta? What, you know, what, uh, anyway, so completely embarrassing, obviously, but troubling. And you can imagine, you don't know with somebody like this. You know, somebody that's a wingnut like this, you don't know what they're going to do. And, um, you know, I saw the, uh, an elected representative, if you're listening outside of Alberta, you probably still know who Janice Irwin is. Uh, one of the more popular politicians, I would, I would say, in the country, quite frankly, an NDP MLA out of our hometown of Edmonton. Uh, she tweeted something along the lines this weekend of it doesn't matter how thick your skin is or we're constantly, I think she said, we're constantly told to, to grow a thicker skin. Uh, she says the thickest skin isn't going to stop a bullet. And uh, you can't tell me. Uh, that somebody as unhinged as this guy uh, could not presumably perpetrate violence in a situation like this. Uh, Christia Freeland remains remarkably calm, as do members of her team, and the elevator door closes. And and we'll talk to Mayor Jackie Clayton in just a second about what happened when that elevator door opened a couple of floors up or wherever the mayor's office is. Obviously, people looked to politicians to say something about this. People in positions of leadership, some of them were conspicuously quiet over the weekend. Uh, I'm, I'm just appalled, but maybe not surprised that Pierre Poliev, he did finally go on the record with the most flaccid, insufficient statement possible, and we'll bring you that. Uh, but Christian Freeland's boss, the Right Honorable Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, uh, in announcing this $100 million fund for LGBTQ2S plus initiatives in Canada, obviously touched on the incident in Grand Prairie, and here's what the PM had to say. Before I wrap today. I want to take a moment to address um, in part the video we saw this weekend of the Deputy Prime Minister being subjected to some extremely disturbing harassment and threats. And this is not an isolated incident. Sadly, this is something we're seeing more and more of. Certainly, uh, members of this community have seen it. uh, But we're seeing increasingly uh, people in public life, people in positions of responsibility, particularly women, uh, racialized Canadians, uh, people of uh, minority uh, or uh, different uh, community groups uh, being targeted almost because of the increasing strength of your voices, of your positions, of the impact you're having around the world and around Okay, so the prime minister goes and and he touches on that. He specifies specifically women. He says specifically people of color, visible minorities, uh, members of of religious minority groups or however you'd like to to categorize it or phrase it or or perceive it. It's an issue and it's becoming a bigger issue. Pierre Polyev's not saying anything about this, right? All, All weekend, he's talking about the carbon tax. He's talking about meeting with people in Calgary. He's talking about how great everything's going and he's getting called out repeatedly. And he's getting called out by conservatives, most notably. Oftentimes, and I don't mean I don't care about criticism from political adversaries, but we as intelligent observers, I think, have to keep an eye out for opportunism, right? It's easy for for people that want to see Pierre Polyev fail or that want to see the conservatives fail, call him out and call him out repeatedly. I was paying attention to the conservatives that were calling him out. And people were saying, listen, this is the guy that's most likely going to be leading our party forward. This guy is going to be setting the tone of our party. This guy is going to be leading our party, presumably, into the next federal election. Well, finally, somebody's able to get Pierre Polyev in front of a microphone. It's been, what, 36, 48 hours. It's not that his Twitter account was down. He was tweeting lots of other stuff. Just nothing about this until somebody finally got a microphone in front of him. And, and as you listen to this, I want you to count subconsciously in your head how long it takes Pierre Polyev to make the verbal assault aimed at Christia Freeland about him. Here he is. Accosted by someone in Grand Prairie. 
Larry and your thoughts on seeing that video? Well, it's uh, absolutely unacceptable. And I can relate, of course, because um, I've been the subject of so much online harassment and abuse. My wife has received so much uh, horrific material directly to her social media account that we've had to hire a private security firm uh, to protect our family against uh, all of that abuse. So unfortunately, uh, this is all too common uh, and all too um, long-standing. We have to put an end to it and demand that everybody uh, treat other Canadians uh, with respect uh, when we debate political ideas. Yeah, first of all, it's not a debate, Pierre. Pull your head out of your ass. <laughs> Second of all, I wonder if, uh, you know, your wife's comments last week about the prime minister and pedophiles may have had something to do with some of the feedback she was getting. But but it took Pierre Polyev exactly two seconds to make this about him and to make this about the conservatives and to both sides this and to what about this, right? Couldn't even say her name, couldn't look directly into the camera, couldn't call out the individual that perpetrated this, who, by the way, is far from sorry for what he did. Now, I've got more of my own thoughts on this, but but let's find out what happened in the couple of minutes after this. I imagine the adrenaline must have been pumping, and I don't know what Mayor Jackie Clayton was expecting because this was all happening in real time. She's preparing for a meeting with the deputy prime minister who's visiting her home city of Grand Prairie. This is a big deal. We're grateful that Mayor Clayton's agreed to join us this morning here on Real Talk. Thank you for making time for us. Uh, hell of a situation, Mayor, to say the very least. Were you there when the elevator doors opened and, and, and Deputy PM Freeland walked through there? Were you were you yeah, right there to no, greet her? Good morning, Ryan. I actually wasn't there. I I arrived at City Hall. We had had other meetings off site uh, prior to that. So I came up a, a different staircase, uh, wasn't in the foyer or in the lobby when it happened, was already in my office. What was it like when she walked into the room, her and her staffers? I would imagine they must have been rattled. What were the first couple of minutes like? What did they say? Oh, to absolutely. You? I, uh, I had someone from our team come in to see if I was OK because they weren't aware if I had been there or not. And I said, I'm fine. What are you talking about? And so got a quick update, went into the meeting room with with uh, Minister Friedland and and said, you know, are you OK? And so heard a bit of background on it. Then her staff, um, you know, they recovered quickly. And I think they that they were um, obviously surprised and it's startling. So I think they uh, composed themselves ra rather quickly. And, and and then, you know, we moved on with our meeting. Yeah, you've had a couple of days now to wrap your mind around it. People, I'm sure many people saw the video statement that you released through the city of GP official Twitter account. Uh, people can follow you in the city on Twitter if they want to see that about two minutes where you say this isn't our Grand Prairie. And I want to ask you about that in just a little bit. But with with 48 hours now to have sat on this, where's your head at this morning? It, it truly is. Um, it, it hasn't died in regards to social media comments and and people's opinions. Um, I think that what's unfortunate is that, like I said in my statement, this doesn't reflect Grand Prairie. This, our region is very welcoming. Our city is known for being a great place to visit, a great place to do business. We are really an entrepreneurial city that is welcoming. We um, are very diverse by nature, but we're also very diverse in uh, opinions. And and the opinion of the governing party of Canada is is um, very split. And there, as no obvious surprise, there's a lot of conservatives in Grand Prairie. Uh, this is a conservative region of Canada, um, but that's really not the point of it. This region, this city, we um, you know we're we are home to over a hundred Ukrainian refugees. We we raise money and volunteer and 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 build and support youth shelters. We are very diverse in in our cultural community. Um, we have the second largest public art gallery in in Alberta. You know we're very diverse and um, however we're very conservative. The problem is is that this. Um, um, this action is really not what I want representing my city. My city is is um, strong in its beliefs, strong in its entrepreneurial, strong in its spirit. And it's one incident uh, that unfortunately is, you know, gone viral, if you want to call it that, in representing my city. And it's not a representation of my city. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely gone viral. There's no doubt about that. Uh, how does someone like you in a position of leadership, if people know about you, you've, you've been a longtime business owner, business leader, you've spent a lot of time working with Grand Prairie's Chamber of Commerce. What sort of damage does this do to a city and a region's reputation? 
Well, I think that we need to remind ourselves that we are entrepreneurial. We have a strong spirit. We are pioneers. And, and anybody that comes to Grand Prairie and visit it, visits is wowed by what we provide. Our value in the region, our value in the province and in the country is second to none. I can tell you that uh, our spirit and, and the fire in our belly that keeps us going is, is awesome. But uh, any single day, I believe that as the elected leader of this community, I will meet with elected leaders of other parties and political stripes. I will meet with business people. Um, and every single day, I work hard to get these meetings to remind people of the value of Grand Prairie, to remind people of what we do and the opportunities. And, and I'll continue to have meetings that bring value to my city. The federal government, on a regular basis, funds municipalities and so when you know one of the conversations that i had was giving a reminder to minister friedland about a, a federal grant that to our municipal neighbors the county of grand prairie had applied for and and there's a lot of opportunities out there for municipalities that work with the federal government and i you know we need to continue to have those conversations as a municipal leader i have conversations to advocate provincially and I'll have conversations to advocate federally. Alyssa's watching us this morning. I believe, if memory serves correct, I think she's from Calgary. And she says, no, she says, this is who we are in Alberta. She says, we need to acknowledge it. No, we're pushing this aside as the so-called bad apples. Uh, this is how many in this province behave. I could think of a lot of examples off the top of my head. And, and Mayor, I'm not aiming this at you. I'll aim it at myself just as much. And I'll aim it at the four and a half other million people that live in Alberta. Uh, for that matter, and I'm proud to live here, and I choose to live here, and I'm raising my sons here. Uh, but, you know, this idea that this is not who we are, there's plenty of evidence to the contrary. How do you wrestle with that personally? I know I do. Uh, I don't, you know, I feel that this is not just Alberta. This is, uh, that's not a fair comment. I think that incidents like this happen across Canada. They happen across the world. We've seen instances like this in Ontario, in Manitoba, in BC, in the United States, in Europe. This is not an Alberta problem. This is a problem globally. It's a problem about how people are civil to each other and how people can have disagreeing opinions but not do that respectfully. This is not just an Alberta problem. So how do we begin to address this? I mean, like we, uh, you can come on. I know you to be, you know, as an aside, a, a few people that I really respect reached out to me last night. They said, Mayor Clayton's on your show. They said, we love Mayor Clayton. They, they see you as like a common sense person, a community leader, somebody that they're, they're very excited to have in a position of leadership in that region of, of northern Alberta. But you know, Mayor, you're on this show. You're going to be talking to reasonable people. You're going to be think. You're going to you're going to be talking to thinkers. You're going to be talking to people that have empathy. You're going to be talking to people that treat others like they would like to be treated. And then there's the other group. Uh, and look at me here now. What am I doing? I guess I'm dividing us into groups. Maybe I'm part of the problem. Like, how do we actually address this? You know, I want to call this guy out and call him a mouth breather and a goon. But then what am I doing? I'm calling names, aren't I? And then it's going to reiterate to him that I'm some elite one percenter. He's probably going to think that I'm some Laurentian elite that live. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't I, I don't actually know. And I'm saying this with sincerity. I don't actually know if we're capable of getting everybody onto the same page, you know, getting us all into a circle and saying, can we all agree that what this dude did in the lobby of Grand Prairie City Hall was unacceptable? Because to this point, I mean, he's done a follow-up interview with Charles Rosnell. He's been on a podcast. He's proud of what he did. He's not sorry for what he did. He's got a lot of people cheering him on. And it's appalling, quite frankly. Yeah, I think that sometimes this is being brought into the fact of, you know, it's a, it's a man disrespecting a woman or how we treat female politicians. This is just about, in my opinion, how we treat people. This, you know, is it unfortunate that the general, well, the man was more than a foot taller than the females that he's yelling at and one of them being, you know, a city employee and, and, and that they felt threatened. That's not okay. Politicians take verbal abuse all the time. They're more seasoned to it. Does that mean it's okay? It's not. I think that we can have completely diverse opinions and still have civil conversations. It doesn't mean that you stand in someone's face and you yell at them and you, you make them feel threatened every single day. But, and you know, the, the comments and the threats that I've been getting on social media now, because the assumption is, is that now I'm supporting the liberal party, you know, that has nothing to do with it. Right. I've been a conservative my entire life. 
It doesn't mean that I have to be a conservative uh, of all colors. I can be the conservative I want to be. And moderates don't mobilize. The average person, they go to work, they drive their kid to hockey, they volunteer in their community, and they do a good job. Some people just feel that they need to express their emotions in an aggressive way. And that's unfortunate. Yeah. You and I can disagree on many things, but I'm never going to be in your face making you feel threatened. And that's the difference. Erica says it's both. She says it's absolutely an Alberta problem, but it's not limited to Alberta. Interesting point. Uh, Mayor, how's, how's city staff holding up? How's city? I mean, everybody's being praised for what we saw. We're not showing the extended length of the video, but when you do see it, you can see people that pressed into a fire hot situation with elevated emotions conducted themselves admirably. Uh, it's now Monday morning, uh, just before we're doing this live, just before nine o'clock. Perhaps you'll be checking in with them once they start to arrive at work. But what's the vibe you're getting at City Hall this morning? Yeah, I mean, our, our team connected over the weekend. We connected on Friday. We've been in regular communication. Um, they're they're fine. And, I, you know, I really want to thank the staff that stepped into that situation and dealt with a situation that could have escalated quite quickly. They dealt with it calmly um, and, and really handled it with the highest level of um, class. And I, I've, I'm really proud of our organization in regards to that. They de-escalated that situation quickly. The thing that people keep forgetting about is the conversations that I was having with Minister Friedland were representing our region and our city. They were important conversations. They were about the fact that, you know, the federal government downloaded the retroactive pay to RCMPs to municipalities with no notice. They were about talking about caribou and species at risk or talking about transportation and, and the disparity of rail cars to the north from CN. They were talking about finding a solution and providing clarity on the carbon compensation. These are things that I was speaking with the minister representing my city, my region, because those are the items that are on her list that are on my list for advocacy priorities. And that's my job to speak about those items with her. So you can say what you want about the naysayers and the haters and the trolls that are out there saying, oh, you know, she's doing this, they're doing this, they're conspiring. That's nothing to do with that. On a daily basis, I represent my region and my city and I fight for the fact that people need to know what a great opportunity is in this region. Alberta and Grand Prairie specifically, this region has a huge future and is integral, integral in Canada's success. If we do not highlight what the opportunities are in this region, in this province, and how it makes Canada stronger, then that's a disservice. And as a politician, that's a problem. As a woman in a position of leadership in politics, do you fear that scenarios like this will chase away good people from a profession that demands a lot and that puts people in the public eye and oftentimes... I mean, I'm using it metaphorically, but in the line of fire. Yeah, it's, it, I can see why people don't want to get in politics. Every single day I'll have somebody say to me, thank you for the work you do. I don't know why you do it, though. I, I couldn't do it myself. And that's unfortunate. There's good people that could be in politics that see instances like this that are like, there's not a hope I'm getting in that. And that's unfortunate. We need to um, politicians understand that they work for the people. We're community leaders. We want to work for the people because we believe what we bring to the table makes a difference. But when you see instances like this, it scares people away and that's only fair. It doesn't need to be that way. I constantly, when I get emails or, or social media, when people are behind a, a keyboard and I say, pick up the phone, let's have a conversation about this. Don't go first into, I'm mad about this and you're doing a bad job because of this. Let's get to the root of the problem and figure it out. We're not always going to be able to fix problems. We're not always going to agree on the solution, but we need to have a conversation to get to solutions. When people just yell at each other and send emails or make social media posts, they're not getting to a solution. They're just venting and, and they feel they have that right to, which is fine, but don't be degrading to people. Nobody's even looking for solutions. I don't mean nobody. I mean, you and the deputy PM are in a meeting looking for solutions. I know you're looking for what's best for your region, but but you, you can't tell me that the the people in the truck convoy or the people blocking the border at Coots or the people blocking the bridge in Ontario, I don't believe the, these people are looking for solutions. Uh, and, and that's what troubles me. I also don't believe that their critics are really, quite frankly, looking for solutions either. But I do believe that one group of people over the weekend are concerned that a politician or a business leader, somebody's going to get killed uh, before anybody really takes this seriously. And I, and I think that the other group is, is chuckling and, and thinks this is, this is pretty great and pretty funny. 
And uh, and that's what concerns me most, Mayor. I really appreciate you making yourself available. I'm, I'm glad that it wasn't worse. Um, and, you know, give your give your staff the metaphorical fist pound from all of us here for holding it together. You should be proud of them. Yeah, I really am. And I, you know, I, I agree that we've gotten to a point where people think that if they pound their fists louder, that they're going to get heard. And I can tell you just because you pound your fist loud doesn't mean you're going to get heard. I think that working on solutions and some people are never, you're right, never going to try to find the solution. There's been so many factors of that, right? The pent up emotion from and uh, sentiment from COVID and, and uh, at times in previous political times, maybe politicians weren't listening. I know that politicians are listening now and they want to find solutions. And I'm, you can call me naive if you want, but I'm optimistic that at the end of the day, the hardworking politicians want to find solutions. That's Grand Prairie's Mayor Jackie Clayton. Thanks for making time for us on this Monday. I know everybody wants to talk to you. Thanks so much. Yeah, you got it. Uh, I've been keeping an eye on the live chat. You know, uh, Scott says this isn't about left and right politics. It's about 4chan and QAnon and conspiracy theories and what we do to address this epidemic. Scott throws a bullseye with that comment. Um, You know, I mean, people are learning more about this guy and and some of the theories that he's pushed out. And, you know, he, he believes he spoke with Charles Rusnell, who... Uh, I consider Charles a friend and he's he's a remarkable investigative journalist and, and you can read the work that he's done on this story. He talks about rage farming. Uh, it's a piece that he's just put out at the Taiyi, uh released that a couple of days ago on Saturday. Uh, he says he spoke with this guy, this bully, and uh, he says that he echoes messages fomented by right wing politicians, experts telling Charles in his reporting to expect more threats. I mean, this guy talks about how thousands of people he believes have died from the vaccine. You know, there's a lot of talk here about, you know, the federal government talking about emissions, specifically emissions in agriculture and fertilizer and and some most especially conservative politicians would have you believe uh, and, and, and it's not necessarily accurate, uh, would have you believe that, for example, Justin Trudeau is, is, is attacking farmers. You know, as, as 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 though looking at decreasing or, or cutting back on emissions is an attack on the farmers themselves. That's a story that we're going to follow, by the way. We want to get you the facts on these types of stories. So when you run into people that, that have gone down these rabbit holes that you're able to say, well, here's the one or two or three main points of this that I heard on Real Talk from an expert, uh, a credentialed, credible expert. And then hopefully it'll elevate the tone and the caliber and the impact of your conversations. Some of you are being critical of uh, Mayor Clayton, saying that she, she's not condemning this enough, that she's trying to champion her city. Uh, well, no shit on that one, uh, because her city is taking punches internationally right now. Uh, Grand Prairie trending across Canada all weekend and not in a good way. Uh, and so I'm not surprised that the mayor is trying to do some damage control here. Now, the deputy PM, Christia Freeland, did issue a statement. We have reached out to her office, obviously. We've requested an interview. She's taken a couple of days with her family uh, until she's back on the grid, and uh, we hope to speak with her as soon as possible. We've also invited some of uh, deputy PM Freeland's senior staffers to join us on the show. We wanted to talk to individuals that were on that elevator and ask them where their heads are at, and, and they've respectfully declined our request for an interview, which is completely understandable. Uh, but Christia Freeland released a photo of her family uh, in in her home territory, so to speak. As mentioned, uh, she hails uh, from Peace River, just north of Grand Prairie. This is where she's from. Uh, and this is what she had to say in her statement. I'm proud to be from Alberta. I'm proud and happy to be spending a few days in the peace country. She says, I'm going to keep coming back because Alberta's home and because I want to keep meeting with Albertans from across this great province and visiting my family and friends here. What happened was wrong. Nobody anywhere should have to put up with threats and intimidation, but the Alberta I know is filled with kind and welcoming people, and I'm grateful for the warm welcome I received from so many people in Edmonton, Grand Prairie, and Peace River over the past few days. One unpleasant incident yesterday doesn't change that. So Christia Freeland's keeping it classy. I'm going to get to a couple of your emails on this. Mikkel uh, wrote in, uh, as did Andrew. They're longer emails uh, because sometimes... It takes some time to formulate your thoughts on this one. And so we're going to leave some time for those emails. And then Mayor Alana Natchew is coming up, Sturgeon County Mayor, in, you know, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, right now, I want to remind you about our, our friends at Friesen Brothers. I mean, you talk about proud Albertans. They've been operating here for more than 65 years, still family owned in 16 different Alberta communities. They've got some really cool stuff going on uh, every month until the end of the year. Friesen Brothers Edmonton and Friesen Brothers Fort Saskatchewan 
are proud to host experts in their field, sharing knowledge on ways to gain a better understanding of our bodies and how we can support our bodies to be the best they can be. Uh, this is a really great Friesen Brothers Healthy Choice initiative. Uh, $25 per person includes a glass of wine, a charcuterie spread, and 15% off Healthy Choice or health and beauty departments during that evening. So you book in. It's going to be a wonderful evening of learning more about healthy lifestyles. If you burn t- uh, book two or more tickets, you'll earn 10,000 smart shopper points. That's worth 10 bucks. Bookings are now open at Friesen.com slash healthy dash insight. Just go to Friesen.com. You'll find it. Book early. Limited spaces are available. The first event is coming up in Edmonton on September 7th. You know, the deadline is fast approaching. September 1st, my friends, is the deadline for the bonus prize in this year's edition of the Covenant Foundation Lottery. This is your opportunity to live in life-changing luxury, a $2.2 million dream home, 5,400 square feet, five bathrooms, a backyard patio, a botanical room, fully furnished. That bonus prize, a Tesla Model S or $100,000 cash. You can get your tickets online today at covenantfoundationlottery.ca or call one 2774 Johnny, on the spot. Johnny, on the spot. What would you do with a hundred grand <laughs> right now? What would you do with a hundred K if it just dropped in your lap? You know... Ten years ago, I'd have some fun, but right now, I'd invest it smartly. You'd be practical, would you? Smartly a word? Probably not, but intelligently. A smart list is one of my favorite <laughs> podcasts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Captain Responsibility over there. You know, our friends at Apex Automation are putting out a call to engineers across Canada right now. If you're looking to switch up or change up or kickstart your career, you're going to want to visit apexautomation.ca today. They're really proud of their corporate culture. They make it their mission to bring out the most in their employees and to deliver the best they can for their clients they're providing intuitive fully autonomous solutions to industry giving people back their time if you're looking to make the most of your engineering career go to apexautomation.ca today and i've got to give a big shout out to our friends at sherwood and st albert dodge a friend of mine was in there over the weekend taking a look at a new suv He said it was worth the referral, the way that he was treated. He liked that there was not a pressure sales situation. My word means something, I hope, when I tell you I was a customer at Sherwood Dodge long before we were doing business with them, and there's a reason for it. These two dealerships in Sherwood Park, St. Albert, can share their inventory, which guarantees you the best selection of Chrysler, Jeep, and Ram in the entire province of Alberta. You can shop them online today. Just visit the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. I got an email from Mikkel. This was on Saturday, a couple of days ago. So Mikkel had taken some time to to think about what happened in Grand Prairie. Uh, This man accosting the deputy prime minister outside an elevator. Uh, He says, Real Talk team, says, I'm sure this is going to be one of many emails you've received on the Christia Freeland assault. He says, there will be those that bristle at me invoking that word. But make no mistake, it was an assault. Mikkel says, first, these actions and behavior are abhorrent, gross, cowardly, childish. The actions of a small individual who's been manipulated. They need to be not only condemned, but actively countered and put down, given to quarter, to run or hide. He says, I want to talk about the civilian responses. Uh, Browsing through Twitter, which I know is not a great representation of a population, but it's a slice. Uh, Far too many people are saying, this is not Alberta, Mikkel says. Everybody needs to stop saying that. Uh, This is very clearly Alberta. There's a difference between what exists and what you might want it to be. But saying this is not Alberta is just a way to separate yourself from the actions and the responsibility around them, to distance yourself, to establish a separation. The term is a distancing act to absolve responsibility. The royal we need to own this. This is our Alberta. We are guilty of either speaking up or letting something go, and there are varying reasons for this. Fear of reprisal, dislike of confrontation, these are valid. While valid, they allow us to separate ourselves from responsibility. There's a cost, we error, and we have to own up to that error and that cost. Says far too many people in the conservative influence sphere are making comments still mentioning Ottawa or a difference of political beliefs. Uh, Says Mikkel, and I'll I'll read what he's writing, so earmuffs kids. He says, none of these things fucking matter. They are just continued low-level dog whistles and attempts to deflect the seriousness around this issue onto somebody else. 
you know, these statements that are coming from leadership hopefuls, piecemeal, milk toast, tepid responses. Why? Because the issue is coming from inside their fucking house, and they are too cowardly to actually stand up to it. In nearly every case, they are guilty of perpetrating the anger the individual in that video was displaying. So are people in the conservative party going to stop with the behavior and the language that fermented the anger and the hate? No, it's too beneficial. So they'll go on pushing narratives and victimhood to get people angry and mad. And the cycle will continue and grow and the anger and the violence and the threats. But they get to say, not me, not I. They took action on their own with not responsibility on my part. Mikkel says there's a term for this, stochastic terrorism. He says, look it up. So-called conservative media, you know, Rebel and Western Standard and Brian Lilly and David Staples and basically everybody at The Sun, you know, they feed off and they promote this anger and hate. And, And I would argue that more so than the political class, they enhance and amplify this anger more than anyone. You know, they're the torchbearers that are championing what's become a dangerous time in this country as evidenced by attacks on journalists and women and people of color and immigrants. Of course they all get angry when they have words like fascist and Nazi thrown at them, yet they're the ones flipping through the manual and working through it line by line. So where does this leave us? Where does this leave Alberta and Canada? Mikkel says, no place good. It's going to get worse before it gets better because anger and hate are easy. As long as one party and its supporters and champions crave the power and the money it brings them, they're never going to stop it. You can't reason with people living in a separate reality. And I hate that so many people have been manipulated by these opportunists. The counter that exists is to try to be a beacon of light and reason and responsibility. That while always hard and difficult at times to not fall into sinking to their level, to use water instead of fire... Not everyone can do this for a variety of reasons. There's always going to be risk involved. People need to do as much as they're able. We can't stop what's going on individually, but we can stop it together. So let's support each other and be kind and always strive for better. That from Mikkel. I really appreciate that. And this one from Andrew, who who wrote in just last night. And he says, Ryan, I've been trying to think of the, the best way to, to write this email to, to, I guess, come across, you know, I'm concerned, he says, I'm going to come across as overly accusatory, but I decided I better keep it real. Andrew, it's music to my ears. He says, I'll I'll preface this by acknowledging that I've not been a fan of conservatism in Alberta and Canada for, for some time now. And the straw that broke my back is hearing about what happened over the weekend to the deputy PM Freeland when she and her staff Uh, We're visiting Grand Prairie City Hall. As an Albertan, I'm embarrassed and ashamed by this incident, and I truly feel that so-called moderate conservatives are benefiting from the rise of political extremism on the right without taking any responsibility for planting their flag with these folks uh, just to stay in power or to have a real shot at said power. You know, we see the likes of Danielle Smith and Pierre Polyev as front runners in their respective leadership races, and they've been courting the votes of these right wing extremists in order to consolidate power to take a run at the highest levels of office in our democracy. But the thing is, would they get there without the moderate small C conservatives that are also voting for them? The answer is no. He says, we all know that this far right ideological rise is very loud, but if it was just this group alone, they would stay on the fringes. He's right. It's becoming more and more clear to me that moderate conservatives are getting too comfortable rubbing shoulders with unsavory types to stay in power, and it's taking Alberta and Canada down a very dangerous path. When the Alberta NDP came to power in 2015, it was because the vote on the right was indeed split between the PCs and the Wild Rose, and it wasn't accidental, this election, as many people in Alberta would like to say. The general electorate rejected both the PCs and the Wild Rose's individual parties, and they're truly different. And then the UCP came to power in 2019 by bringing those two groups together. And anybody living in Alberta since the last election can tell you how that's going. Andrew says, the question I ask myself is this need to like stick it to the libs or to like own the NDP. Is that more is that more important to moderate conservatives and voters than getting into bed with the same people putting our democracy at risk with intimidation and violence and misinformation and racism and the like? These two leadership races will play out, says Andrew, as they will. But voters in this province and across the country will need to make a moral decision. 
if and when we have a Daniel Smith-led United Conservative Party or a Pierre Polyev-led Conservative Party of Canada, CPC, on the ballot the next time we go to the polls, by placing an X beside either of these names on the ballot, that X enables and empowers the ideas that they ran on to get to that position in the first place. We may need political change when we go to the polls next time around, but we're also responsible as citizens in a democracy for the votes that we cast and for the people that we vote for. The silver lining to all this is that we still have some time before leadership races are over. Indeed, conservatives may decide to go to a different direction than their respective frontrunners. I hope so, says Andrew. And in the meantime, we have time to do some soul searching before we're afforded the opportunity to place our votes in both leadership races and in the general election. David says, I hope Real Talkers have a fantastic week. I'm a big fan of the show, and I wish you all the best moving into your new studio. Thanks, David. We appreciate that. Mm Mm-hmm. How are you feeling about this? I, I, you and I walked in today. And we always kind of greet each other enthusiastically in the rap, mornings. Yeah. But, but but I walked in and, and you just went, Ugh. Well, I mean, I could pile on. But I mean, I, I, obviously the worst thing is this This is a, like a brute. <laughs> it's the easy. Yeah. It's a nice way of describing him yelling at a politician. But I think another bad part of this is this guy actually had a chance to confront someone. And I, I saw him go on a couple podcasts after this and, and talk about the issues, why he was so fed up, why he was mad. He didn't mention any of that to her. He had a, he had a chance to talk about, you know, the climate restrictions being placed on Alberta farmers. He had a chance to talk about vac- vaccine mandates or yell something about small businesses being destroyed in Canada. Instead, he, he went right for the B and the C word, which is like, <laughs> you're taught that in high school when you're doing the mock U- UN debates and, yeah. and the parliamentary stuff. The first person to lay insults probably doesn't have a point and is the less intelligent one, right? But also, he went on these podcasts. I won't name them, the so-called freedom podcasts or whatever, uh, and was talking about our rights and freedoms being taken away. I'll tell you, man, you go down to the States, if he had done that to Kamala Harris, his teeth would have been on the floor. I mean, their phones would have been taken and probably scrubbed to the videos. The fact that he was even allowed to walk into this building, go right to the front desk, yell these things at her and then be treated with, I'm going to say respect. You said those guys who they, they didn't touch them, you know, they, yeah. it, so I, the whole I thing guarantee is just, you. And I can't say that I know Christian Freeland that well, but she's been on this show several times. Mm-hmm. Um, I would almost guarantee you that she would have sat like you notice when when he yells from across the lobby he goes Christia and she turns around for a second she was going to address with him. kind of a smile on yeah. her like she was like yeah like she turned around if he said hey can I bend your ear for a quick second like look at this I got dirt under my fingernails I work hard for my family yeah. I'm struggling and we're, even if he was struggling. aggressive with doing it at least he's getting a point across there, yeah. was, there was no there was no point there was just there's no substance nothing. You know, and then we're talking about this. I mean, we're burying it's not the lead, but we're burying this. I mean, you know, Danielle Smith, uh, you know, over the weekend, this Paul Blart, by the way, I think they're going to come after her on the copyright on this. I don't know what studio released uh, the mall cop series, but but uh, you see this about the the Justin Trudeau's climate police thing that that Danielle Smith's pushing out. You know, she says he's 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 going to hire climate change enforcement officers and, and, and they start talking about how there's going to be like handcuffs and like guns and weapons and the Justin Trudeau climate police are going to come after you. Like this stuff's just not true. <laughs> it's just not true. There's different interpretations of initiatives. Someone can say, well, the prime minister, you know, Justin Trudeau wants to do this and, and this is what we think about it. Or, you know, Prime Minister Stephen Harper was going to do this and here's what we think about it. Sure. This is not that. You know, but this is this is, you know, in, in that first email there from Mikel that said, I, I feel like, I you know, I'm, he feels for the people that are being misled, that are being duped, that are being tricked, that are being sucked into these conspiracy theories. And he was doing it. You can let us know what you think about this. Mm-hmm. Talk at RyanJesperson.com. <laughs> Alberta's former <laughs> energy minister, Mark McQuake Boyd, is, is watching the show live right now. Uh, means a lot to me. I see her on the live chat. She says, I've met Christian before. She absolutely would have talked to that guy had he been civil. I bet you Marg has put up with some bullshit like this in past. Guarantee it, as a matter of fact. The energy minister for, for a Rachel Notley government in Alberta mm-hmm. through a, a time of, of, of economic mm-hmm. crisis and, and the introduction of the carbon tax and the Bill 6 and the... And she's in Alberta. She knows the landscape. She probably thought it was going to be negative. She, she, I don't, think, I don't think she turned around thinking, oh, here's someone to give me a hug. Like, sure. she probably thought she was going to get into some sort of debate, but it just, 
it never happened. It just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, our next guest is uh, first elected as mayor of Sturgeon County, uh, what, five years ago now, I guess, in 2017. She's ser- uh, serving her second term on council, f- comes from four generations of farmers, uh, but she spent most of her adult life as a small business owner in the oil and gas service industry. Mayor Alana Natchi returning to the show. It's been a while. Uh, thanks for making time for us. A good morning to you. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks for the opportunity to speak this morning. Really appreciate it. Yeah. uh, Before we get to, I want to get to this Prairie Gardens thing that's going on, because I know a lot of people in Alberta, and and most particularly probably in your neck of the woods, are wondering what's going on. Uh, But let me ask you about, I mean, everybody at at work or in the coffee shops or on the soccer fields today are going to be talking about what happened in Grand Prairie over the weekend. Uh, How are you wrapping your mind around it? Where's your head at? You know, it's it's really unfortunate uh, that that's the level of public discord and dialogue. Uh, and when people look at who's running for leadership and they're not pleased to see uh, potentially uh, maybe the best of the best, uh, you'd have to ask yourself why. And certainly uh, reading your email on a Monday morning or listening to some of the voicemails you receive or some of the comments that are made out in public, this is a prime example as to why fewer and fewer people are running for public office. Uh, because people are picking positions, uh, no longer having open uh, dialogue uh, and respectful debate, seeking solutions that uh, that are good for you know as many people as possible. Uh, it's just uh, all out. This is my position. That's your position. And we're seeing that play out even in the Prairie Gardens discussion. Uh, and it's unfortunate because we really do have a lot of issues that we need solutions for. And you only get solutions when you have diversity of thought and voice at a table. And you only get that when you can actually have some respectful dialogue. And unfortunately, that is not who's uh, taking the microphone in this province or across this country right now. I remember hearing the when the, when the uh, I had this like Wizard of Oz curtain pulled back moment when uh, adversaries Brian Mason and Thomas Lukasik confessed to me. Uh, that the NDP leader and, and deputy premier at that time, those are the offices that they held, that they, they were actually famous friends and <laughs> that they would after the legislative session, they would they would go to the pub, their favorite pub, and they'd have beers together and they'd laugh and they would celebrate the barbs that each had thrown to each other and the, the shots they had landed in the house, so to speak. But they were great friends and I believe they remain so uh, to this day. Now you get the sense that political opponents you know, would rather slash each other's tires or, or fight at the bike racks than find any sort of consensus on how to serve Albertans or how to serve Canadians. You've been in elected office for what, like five years now? It seems it like it seems to me like this is a recent development. I mean, not to say that people haven't disagreed or that there hasn't been anger as a factor in politics. Of course, there has been. Uh, you know, we just asked the Kennedy family, you know, two of them shot dead. Just ask, you know, I mean, I mean, there's there's tons um, of, of horrible uh circumstances and and examples of violence uh, playing itself out with elected officials as the targets. But do you get the sense that this is a new development? Not so much. I mean, the election 2017 here wasn't, wasn't all that amicable either. Mm. Uh, There was certainly um, some pretty serious uh, vitriol directed towards me and other uh, members of council and others that were running. And even after the election, uh, it was it was concerning that there, there were times that I did reach out to RCMP and there was times where leading into the election last fall, I thought, am I really up for this again? Like, oh, it can get so ugly and so personal. So, no, it's it's not new. I think because it just folks are getting bolder and bolder and bolder, obviously, because leadership does need to set the standard of what is uh, preferred or expected. And I would say we have been backsliding into a form of American uh, politics, which does not serve uh, Canada well. Um, And so in large part, I think that's just why we're seeing this growing emboldened, um, extreme, aggressive, negative uh, attitude being directed towards one another and elected officials. And, And so we need to do better. Uh, and we need to actually st- think, start holding people accountable uh, for their actions. You know, freedom of speech is really important, but you also have to understand when your right to speech turns into intimidating individuals. And certainly, when I saw the video of uh, what happened to to Deputy Prime Minister, uh, you know, I, my first reaction on Twitter was I was going to say I think I just got a voicemail from his brother. 
because mm -hmm. that was and I thought oh just don't even engage I just don't yeah. have the bandwidth to put up with this right now I've got my own stuff going on uh I'm not stepping into that so I so yeah you know just because of the vitriol that starts and the and the the, the personal attacks it does make you think twice about whether or not you're going to bother to weigh in on something so that intimidation works do you think that it's possible to get the train back on the tracks like I know, I know you to be an optimist. Uh, I've seen you in person many times, and you're always you, you're, you're a champion of your community, and you're an optimist. Uh, but I think a lot of people are probably being led to believe that this is the tone of politics moving forward. Do you agree or disagree? I, I think we're potentially becoming victims of, of of design because I see the the politicization of topics. I see. Um, you know, sound bites being taken to speak to larger issues that are void of fact. And, and politicians take advantage of being able to just use sound bites to shift thinking and to get votes without really being concerned about how informed our citizens are. We are falling down in our civics classes in high school to be able to understand and teach individuals what jurisdiction, what levels of government are responsible for, how it works, how you make change. Uh, and, and we're seeing the, you know, the cumulative effect of that now where people just don't actually understand how government works. And you have politicians who are more interested in staying in power instead of serving the public that they've been elected to serve. Elected leaders need to plan for decades, not for your election cycles. So there's a number of things uh, at play here, unfortunately, and, and so it's coming home to roost. But the solution is for elected leaders to actually lead by what the decisions are that we need to make for the decades in front of us and not for the election in, in the election cycle that we're currently in. Um, but but that, takes, um, that takes a certain type of person to do that. And those aren't necessarily people who are signing up for this job right now because of the climate uh, that we're currently uh, working in. Uh, this this next story, I want to ask you about this, and I appreciate your availability on this. It, it'll strike some people that are listening from elsewhere in Canada as a, a, quite a hyper local story, but it's a, it's a story of a family owned business claiming that the government, uh, the local government, you, uh, are shutting them down, and uh, they say that they're devastated. This is the Prairie Gardens Adventure Farm, owned and operated by the Anderson family, a long time agritourism business where people can show up and, and do their own like you pick uh, type stuff i'm taking a look at the edmonton journal's coverage of this story but everybody's talking about it what's what's going on with with prairie gardens they say that that you and the county are shutting them down they say that they can't operate they say they're devastated what's your side of this you know uh tam and prairie gardens is a much beloved institution in this area you know when my kids were little i took them there on school field trips uh, tam invited me there uh during the election in 2017 i i completely respect uh the work that they've done and the success that they've experienced but at a certain point in one's business you have to manage your growth and you have to put in certain processes in place to make sure that the public is safe uh, when they are visiting, especially a farm. And what we're seeing here is, uh, you know, we're on the edge of a very young and one of the youngest and fastest growing cities uh, in Canada. And, you know, based on just food interests and COVID, people are more concerned about where their food comes from. They want to have a better understanding. They want to shop local. So Tam had a successful business before, but these have been ongoing issues that have just become larger and larger as her business has grown and the popularity of Prairie Gardens has grown. And we've been working with her for years to find solutions around public safety and, and traffic and noise. Um, and in fact, uh, in the, the 2021, Sturgeon County uh, Council struck a task force of area uh, agribusiness uh, owners and farmers to try to understand what we could do to support that type of business. Because what we saw were all sorts of pop-up event venues, wedding venues, uh, visits to farms, overnight camping, you name it. All of this stuff was just organically happening. 
And some people would seek permits. We didn't actually have permits. We didn't have these definitions in our land use. We, and then you get complaints from people that are next to that and don't like it and want you to enforce something, but you can't enforce a, a rule or regulation that you don't have. Mm. So we worked with a number of agribusiness uh, owners over the course of several months in 2021 to come up with definitions around land use and, and, and Tam, uh, Ms. Anderson, sat on that task force and contributed to that work. And there was uh, a public hearing in June. So anyone that's interested in, in a broader uh, story and deeper detail on this can, you know, go and look at the June 14th public hearing to understand that the challenges of, you know, farmers that want to be able to stay on farm and increase their, um, you know, their income and, and people that also live in the area or commute through the area that want to be able to still pass through safely and enjoy their properties nearby. Uh, and so these are all things that we need to balance. And, and this is stuff we're working on. And, and I'm quite frankly, I'm disappointed that some of the easy solutions uh, that I think could have been implemented weren't. Uh, and ultimately, when you see visitors pushing baby strollers and walking uh, children down highways, um, you've you've got to take some measures there to stop that. And was, we've even reduced speed. We've done a number of things to try to support her taking extra steps, but ultimately those are within her care and control. I was paying attention to some of the public commentary on this over the weekend, and, and I'm curious to know what you say to people that suggest that you're picking on farmers uh, by taking action on Prairie Gardens specifically. Um Prairie Gardens is still able to continue their, their farming activities. We in no way have inhibited that. Um, but when you have, uh, when having a hundred people to your farm a day uh, isn't something that you can do because it's, it's, it's not um, the right uh, balance of visitors uh, buying the right produce, uh, you'd have to say, is that actually farming? I, I know a number of farms that don't have a hundred people people visit their uh, farm a day or, or thousands actually. These are events and this is agritourism and that is what we're trying to, to uh, get a grip on. There's got to be public safety considerations when you're bringing thousands of tourists to your center. Um, and so we can't confuse what is traditional farming, what is intensive farming with what is agritourism. Mm. And the, the lines are being blurred here for, for, for whatever reason, but they're, they're two very different things. And, and again, the task force uh, that Ms. Anderson sat on denoted that in, in recommending that we add definitions of event venues, diversified agriculture. Um, and so that's, that's what we're doing. But in the meantime, you know, we've issued stop orders to a number of venues in, in Sturgeon County that are either operating without permits or are breaking the agreements around their permits. And, and we've worked with a number of them through forbearance agreements to try to create a middle ground to allow them to conduct their business while they're becoming uh, compliant and while we work on developing these new land use definitions. But, but ultimately, there were steps that that needed to be taken uh, that weren't, and we need to keep the public safe. Um, and so these are these are the steps that yeah, the, the, these are you're you're on here, and and I'm saying this in a joking way, but like we got to talk about all the boring stuff, right? Think the land use stuff and the process and the committees, and but that's kind of how it works. But this is when people's eyes glaze over, glaze over. It's the sensational stuff. It's the emotion that that people connect with, right? And so someone's saying, well, the, the county's coming in and like shutting these guys down, and my family's gone there to get our pumpkin or to pick apples, you know, since I was a little kid, and then now we want now the county shutting us down and, and then you think you get into one situation where you didn't do something or you didn't take action and, and a one-ton dually drives by and and the, and, the, and the you know the extended side mirror for the trailer clips the back of the head of a parent that's pushing a, a stroller and then all of a sudden you've got a fatality uh and nothing was done about it and then you want to talk about emotion and then you want to talk about who's on the hook and you've got yourself a real problem so how are you? How, I mean, I guess I would say, how are you managing it? You're talking to us. That's one way you're managing this. Uh, but where does this go from here? Like, uh, is the goal to get them up and running again in time for fall, which I know is really big for their business, or, or, or what's what's realistic? Well, I think what was realistic was having these measures in place before this season started because sure. we had these issues last year. 
Um, they repeated themselves again this year. They repeated themselves at open farm days. And we know that harvest is coming. We know the busy season is coming. So you're exactly right. We, we could not risk having more people show up at that location uh, and, and risk having uh, pedestrians and traffic uh, you know, collide because quite frankly, it is harvest season. And so there are more vehicles on the road and there's larger vehicles on the road. And when folks are driving out uh, to the county to visit, they need to clearly understand where they're going, where it's safe to park and where it's safe to access whatever venue that they're uh, they're approaching. And so we're, we're hoping that this particular uh, venue will continue to work with our planning and development department, which has been taking place for years. Uh, and this time, maybe we'll get the solutions that we should have saw uh, last year or earlier this year. Because quite frankly, after years of asking for the very same thing, and years of it not being done, uh, enough is enough. And, and, you know, hopefully there's uh, more focus on finding a solution <clears throat> quickly uh, for them so that so that we can uh, lift those restrictions. But but ultimately, there was restrictions placed on earlier this year uh, that were not met. And so we've made more restrictions, hoping that they can manage that number of visitors uh, safely, the, the 100 a day. And when we see that they have a plan in place to be able to manage larger numbers, uh, then we can allow that. But until then, uh, no. This is music to my ears. Lauren says uh, this issue is on the local news without the reasons why this operation was shut down. Now we know, but the reason should have been featured on the news. Yes, it should have, Lauren. Make sure you tell your friends about Real Talk. You can subscribe on YouTube wherever you get your podcasts. Mayor, forgive the shameless plug. I saw a window there. I had to take it. Before I thank you for your time and you get back to the business of running Sturgeon County. Let me ask you about this agreement that you committed to with Alexander Chief uh, George Arcan Jr., a relationship agreement on behalf of your two councils. This was just, what, like 10 days ago or so. What does it mean? It means that we are committed to building uh, safe and sustainable communities that, that understand that we are distinct communities, but that we rely on one another and that when we uh, look at the future of Alberta and the future of our communities, we understand that that future needs to include uh, Indigenous voices. Uh, that is something that's important uh, to the work that I do on the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub, which is the first hydrogen hub uh, in Canada. And uh, right out of the gate, we invited both the uh, Enoch and Alexander First Nation to the table to be a part of forming what the energy evolution in Alberta looks like. Uh, and so the agreement between Sturgeon County and Alexander First Nation is just a structure for our councils and our administrations to be able to work together to take some of that work uh, and bring it home and start that meaningful economic reconciliation uh, here. And so uh, that's what uh, that's what the agreement was for. And I just want to touch on, um, because I know you've got uh, things to get onto as well, but there was a, a lot of upset around the corn maze and the inability now for the Every Child Matters uh, teaching uh, that was being planned through that corn maze. Apparently Prairie Gardens had um, signs made up so that as you went through the corn maze, you would be able to learn about Every Child Matters and about Indigenous history in Alberta. And I commend them for that. Sure. But when we're enforcing bylaws, we're not looking at, well, whose wedding is it? And what charity event? We're, we're not looking to that level. We're looking at what are the rules that the organization was given? What did they legally agree to uh, follow? And, and have they broken those rules? And then you enforce. But I would say for folks that are concerned about the um, the, the lack of money that would uh, that would have been raised uh, had they been able to visit the corn maze, you know, you can still go on and and Prairie Gardens could use their vast social media network to encourage people to still support Every Child Matters by going online to that charity, donating. Prairie Gardens could also share information that they were going to share on their corn maze on their social media platform, because if that's what you care about, that's what's important to you, find a solution and find a way. And I think I just want to make sure that that's top of mind for everybody. If yeah. that's charity that's important to you, please follow through and support them. I'm not going to, I don't want to wisecrack too much about this for obvious reasons, but like, uh, you know, a commitment to reconciliation by way of a, an every child matters display, which is wonderful. Uh, it doesn't get you off the hook from following the laws, 
Like if I, I find out that like my favorite restaurant doesn't have a food handling permit or the chef's not washing his hands after using the washroom, but he has an every child matters shirt on, it's irrelevant. Uh, I'm yeah. not trying to, I'm not trying to be an asshole, but like, that's, no, that, no, that's I, I, come on. Yeah. If, if, if you're, um, if you're a food inspector or health and safety inspector, you're not going to show up at a, at a mass event center and, and listen to the owner say, well, I just got this one more massive event to do this weekend. Then yeah. shut down. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, Patrick is, 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 Hey, do you have two minutes? Uh, I, I, can I take two more minutes of your time? Cause Patrick says he wants to, he wants us to hype the hydrogen hub. And I, there's always a ton of stuff going on out there and look at this for people watching on YouTube. I'll tell the people listening to the podcast, you, you got this little smile, the corners of your mouth turn up because I know that energy is such a huge part of the economy out there. And, and, and everybody knows uh, about the, you know, Northwest refinery and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and what are, what are, you know, can you bring us up to speed now that we have you here, mayor, uh, what are a couple of the, the exciting developments? What are a couple of the things you're working on? People obviously have a great degree of uh, interest in, in the economy and in jobs in particular in the energy sector, which is huge in your neck of the woods. Yeah, well, you know, um, the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub is a, a group of like-minded uh, people who are focused on finding solutions and coming together to have discussions, both with academia, with all levels of government, and and First Nations to look at what infrastructure investments are already here, what natural resources are already here, and 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 certainly uh, 22, 23 years of a successful association at the Alberta's Industrial Heartland Association, where there's 40 uh, billion dollars worth of uh, investment that's been made over the decades, uh, and and the infrastructure around uh, natural gas and the expertise in engineering that is there. And of course, the expertise in engineering that went into uh, NWR that is utilizing uh, carbon capture. Uh, Shell uh, Quest is using carbon capture. So all of these um, decades of investment in education have brought us to a place now where we have an opportunity to still utilize the natural resources that we have in the low cost natural gas feedstock and investment in infrastructure to be able to decarbonize both uh, fuel and uh, energy in the coming decades. And so that is, again, one of those places where I know the provincial and the federal government are working together quite well, yeah. but that's not the soundbite that you hear covered on the news. And I, and I know uh, Minister Regan has been on your, uh, your show before and talked about that. And so this is what I see as a unicorn because hydrogen is the one thing where uh, the First Nations that uh, we work with, the municipalities that we work with here in the Edmonton region and, and both the provincial and the federal government have plans and they agree that this is the way forward. So right now is, and you know, there's obviously a pilot projects uh, happening across Alberta on heavy haul transport. There's um, Air Products is doing an autothermal uh, reforming um, investment, uh, millions of dollars in Edmonton. And so these are all opportunities where we can produce uh, lower emission energy, but the challenge is getting historical competitors and all levels of government to come up and choreograph really uh, a complex transformation of our energy system here. How to use both renewables and fossil fuels, uh, both to meet energy, electricity and heating demands. And we have the ability to do that. We, we just need the hub to be able to convene the table to have those discussions of all those folks so that we can really sequence investment, both public and private, and determine what infrastructure needs to go and where so that we can get, you know, lower our emissions here, but also then access both east, west and north coast yeah. uh, to be able to uh, export to the globe. I was uh, five trillion dollars, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm exactly. I, I'm, I'm referencing an interview that you did with Gerald Vanderpil with the Edmonton Journal back in May, uh, where you, as the chair of the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub, told him we already have the talented workers, the expertise, the pipelines to succeed. Uh, as you just said, the global hydrogen market expected to be worth up to two point five trillion dollars within the next twenty five years or so. Um, does, I might come across looking like an ignoramus here, but does this uh, green hydrogen agreement? Uh, that the Prime Minister just signed with German Chancellor Schultz, does that have any implications for Sturgeon County with regard? I mean, how did that change your conversations over the past week or so? Well, you know, 
I would have preferred to have that kind of a visitor discussion out in Alberta, but uh, I, I certainly do understand how important the East, East Coast is both in their own natural gas reserves uh, and whether it be wind, solar or um, or green hydrogen through the use of, of uh, uh, water. But it, you know, I think also that was potentially why uh, Deputy uh, Prime Minister Freeland was here to acknowledge that yes, there's green hydrogen uh, happening on the East Coast potentially, but that there's also a way forward for Alberta. And unfortunately, uh, her visit was, you know, <laughs> was covered more for uh, a negative few yeah. minutes captured in Grand Prairie instead of her acknowledgement that that hydrogen is important and Alberta is a very important part of that and being a part of Canada having a strong national agenda uh, is important to Alberta to be able to reach those tide waters and have the federal government truly understand the level of expertise that's here on the ground um, and that we should be concerned about low emissions low carbon hydrogen not specific about colors because uh whether it's hydro or, or other ways to make green hydrogen, we need to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples, that whole wheel to well uh, carbon accounting. And that's not necessarily always done. I think we just need to look at the emissions. And I hope countries like Germany understand that although they may want green, the reality is this is what's, you know, blue is what's affordable and, and blue is lower emissions and will continue to drive down uh, fugitive methane emissions upstream, which will continue to lower the, uh, the footprint of traditional oil and gas. There is a way forward. Uh, we should just be picking uh, the, the investments to enable that, not necessarily trying to pick winners and losers based on whether it's green or blue. Mayor, I've just had Patrick follow up. Um, this happens. I don't know if you ever get confused and twisted up in text messages where there's like no tone implied or thing. And so Patrick circles back. And when he said hype hydrogen, he says, no, he goes, no, 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 that's not what I meant. He says, hydrogen is all hype. No hope. <laughs> he says you need Paul. There's, so yeah. what would you say to Patrick? He says, it's all hype. No hope. You know, I'm, I'm not an engineer or, or a chemist. Um, and there's definitely diverging views uh, on hydrogen. But the, the thing is, hydrogen is a common denominator. Hydrogen can be made into uh, ammonia for transport. It can be, it can uh, store uh, even renewable energy, uh, where right now, you know, batteries can be quite expensive and have their own downfall. So I think it is something that we need to uh, to work on. And when you look at larger, you know, massive companies, whether it be uh, Amazon, CP, there's there's a number of them around the world that are investing in hydrogen. Japan's investing in hydrogen, and, and there's some visionary governments that see this as being a common denominator and one of several tools that will have to be implemented to be able to lower emissions at the very same time as demand is concurrently increasing yeah it is not going to be the silver bullet and anybody that says there's one thing that's going to be the solution is probably uh, not as informed as they need to be but i do believe that hydrogen is a very important part of decarbonizing difficult to decarbonize industries like steel like cement like heavy haul transport and potentially even uh you know replacing bunker fuel uh mm -hmm. you know for for those large cargo ships there is a way forward. Um, and yes, there's a lot of excitement about it because, and and maybe we need to ask ourselves why this is the third time that it's been coming around. Third time is the charm. Um, I, I do believe that there's uh, huge opportunities around hydrogen, uh, but we're always, I think, need to have those open discussions and consider all points of view so that nobody's putting on blinders and forgetting why we're even you know doing this. Uh, we're doing it to reduce emissions. We're doing it to be able to continue to employ people in Alberta and transition responsibly, working with post-secondary uh, education um, systems so that we are reskilling and upskilling people in that transition. Um, that's 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 what's important to me, and that's what's important to most of the people I think in Sturgeon County, in Alberta, and in Canada beyond. The world needs Canadian clean energy. We are ethical, and we are. Uh, uh, we've long provided technology both here and around the world around energy. We still need to be, need to be a part of that conversation and, and, um, and hydrogen is an important part of that.
Mayor, I appreciate your availability this morning. It's nice to connect with you again. Thanks for doing the show. Thanks, Ryan. You take care. Yeah, you got it. That's Sturgeon County Mayor Alana Nachu. Uh, Corey says we need to be investing in geothermal for Alberta's personal energy needs as well. Do you know much about geothermal? I did. A, I did an interview with a guy a couple of years ago. It's 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 really neat. It's fascinating stuff. Too. All this stuff is really neat. But I think the main point is we need a good mix of everything. Uh, most yeah. of the experts say like you know oil isn't going away, but we need a good mix of yeah. wind, solar, hydrogen, uh, natural gas, all of it because we're using more and more energy every year. Yeah. Globally, so like I, we just need more of it. Uh, one and of the things that good catches, mix of everything, right? it catches my attention whenever they say that th- this is something geothermal is a good example of this with all the skilled drillers mm-hmm. in Alberta. And they say that, you know, there are there are skill sets that translate into newer or, you know, or what do you want to say? Emerging energy mm-hmm. uh, industries or markets. Um, Marie simply says, I think uh, Marie says, well, Ryan, uh, <laughs> I always this these right Ryan don't just listen to one side of the story yeah I mean I'm just talking to one person right now so sure <laughs> um <laughs> I'll get our team of 11 producers on this immediately no but Marie in all seriousness she's right she says you should do a round table on this a hundred percent I think that's a great idea Marie and we will do that we'll add it to the list I mean we still owe real talkers a round table on uh what, what we you call them like the, the the woke and the the fascist and we're gonna <laughs> yeah. all the names that everyone's calling each yeah. other that we're gonna do what did we call it again we were gonna call it the the, the dog whistle round table, yeah. I think we were going to call it. <laughs> so uh, we always, and I'm being serious here for a second, we always appreciate your suggestions on what you'd like to hear on the show. It's your show. We want to know what you want to hear on this show. And then we get messages like this one uh, that absolutely makes our day. And this is from Maggie B., who says, this is my first time listening to this show live. It's her first time watching live. Maggie's heard the show before, but it's her first time watching live. And and she says, "Uh, I'm enjoying the chat. I love the interaction. I'm going to have to make this a daily habit. Maggie, that's music to our ears. Tell your friends. Uh, In just a second, we're going to get to positive reflections. I'm so excited to tell you this story about Keanu Reeves. He's one of the most likable and beloved A-list celebrities on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. You always hear these stories that apparently Keanu doesn't want to get out. But you always hear these stories of like... Then he he shows up. But but he like he like worked on a but he doesn't he wants the stories to stay quiet oh. and so he's like worked on films and then you hear like it was someone's birthday and like Keanu catered the whole meal for everybody or mm-hmm. or someone did a great job as like the director of photography on a film or something and Keanu like bought them a Harley Davidson he seems Just, like a very grateful guy like he knows he's had it yeah good so he wants to spread that around yeah, yeah. And so a, a Keanu Reeves themed positive reflections in just a second. But first, I want to let you know that that interview was presented by our friends at Park Power, your friendly local utilities provider. We're talking about energy. Uh, I mean, hey, what about natural gas, electricity? Your family needs it. But you don't want to pay more than you have to, right? Why not go to parkpower.ca today? Compare rates. They also have internet service. You bundle all three together. You're going to save on administration costs. Plus, they donate 10% of their electricity profits to charity. And you get to choose which charity your contribution's going to. How cool is that? They don't charge you more so they can make the donation. They take it out of their profits. It's one of the reasons why we are so proud to partner with Park Power. When you sign up, make sure you use the promo code 2022-REALTALK. That's going to knock $70 off your first bill. I told you about our little guy celebrated his seventh birthday about a month ago. As a matter of fact, it was a month ago today. And our friends at the Dairy Queen in Westmount partnered with the Dairy Queen in Nemeo to process a last minute order for us. Why was it last minute? Because it was my fault because I waited too long, but I reached out to them and they said, don't worry, we got you covered. And it resulted in a fabulous minions Dairy Queen cake. Uh, you can go online right now today. Find the Dairy Queens in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road, or go visit them in person and order your perfect customized Dairy Queen cake. I personally recommend them. Our friends at Eden Landscaping want to remind you that your yard has so much more potential than you're maybe giving it credit for. You look out there and you see just that boring lawn. You work so hard to get rid of the dandelions. Or maybe you're like these new hippies that just let the dandelions take over the entire property. Either way, there's a new trend called the Urban front yard butterfly approach and Eden Landscaping is mastering it drawing pollinators back into the urban centers we need them 
You can bring your outdoor space to life, and that journey can start today with Eden Landscaping. We're about to get to that time in the year where my message is going to start changing to talk to Mike and his team about what they can do for you in the spring. But if you have an emergency project, maybe some excavation or retaining wall that needs to be done before the snow falls, do not hesitate. Get in touch with Eden Landscaping today. And our friends at Local Environmental want to remind you that, you know, some people say it's only garbage, but not them. They believe that communities deserve better, better service, better prices, and more support for local causes. Go to localenvironmental.ca today to find out how they can help in Edmonton and Whitecourt and Regina and all across the prairies, family-owned Local Environmental, the sponsor of Trash Talk, right here on Real Talk every Friday this week. It'll be on a Thursday. Thursday will be our final show of the week this week. The first show of every week, every week, our friends at Kubi Energy give us reason to focus on the positives, to find the stories that made us smile, that made our day, that filled our buckets, so to speak. It's Positive Reflections presented by Kubi Energy. You know, we ask you to submit your positive reflections so we can share them with the audience. And that's exactly what Alan the Farmer did over the weekend. We loved this photo. Alan says there is nothing better than a 7 a.m. tea time at the beautiful Mont. Montgomery Glen. Now, Johnny, I had to do some Googling. I didn't know this. Montgomery Glen is a beautiful golf course in Wetaskiwin, Alberta. Oh. Look at that. If you're listening to this on the podcast, swing on by our YouTube channel and take a look at Alan the Farmer's photo from the tee box. Unbelievable mm. scene there as the sun cresting, just rising up over that cloud cover. How beautiful is that? Alan, I trust that your drive was long, straight, and exactly where you wanted it to be. Thanks for sharing it with us. He said, have a great morning, real talkers. I love that, Alan. Thanks very much. And here's the story of one of the most beloved movie stars in the world. We can be so proud he's a Canadian, can't we? Keanu Reeves, did you get this story out of the United Kingdom over the weekend? He bumps into a wedding party in the UK. He's over there shooting a documentary. He sticks around. They asked him. He runs into the groom who's in the pub. He's, uh, the groom's having one. Maybe calm his nerves. Who knows what's going on? He runs into Keanu Reeves. And so he says, well, w- how would you feel? Uh, the the four-star hotel in Daventry. And, and, and he says, what about maybe joining us at the reception? So as the story goes, Keanu Reeves pops up to where he's staying. He throws on a suit jacket. He comes back down to the Fosley Hall Hotel and Spa and actually attends their reception. After the reception, the bride, the groom, and their guests are headed over to the Fox and Hounds pub in Charwelton. Well, guess who shows up? Yeah, the star of the Matrix franchise. (laughs) The bar's owner, Danny Ricks, says he was shocked when Keanu Reeves walked in, sat down at a table with everybody else, his new friends, people he'd just met. It says it's not every day you get a Hollywood star walk into your pub. It made everybody's evening. Now, I don't know if you care about this, but he had a Caesar salad uh, followed by a main course of falafel. And um, and here's the part I wanted to read. Uh, the owner of the pub says he washed it down with, quote, quite a few double whiskeys. Uh, he says Keanu like is just that. a down to earth guy. Really nice to everybody. Everything nice you hear about him appears to all be true. Isn't it great when your heroes don't disappoint you right isn't it great when celebrities don't let you down a shout out to keanu reeves <laughs> what if he comes to your wedding though and he's like your marriage isn't real you're living in a fabrication this is the red <laughs> pill the blue pill <laughs> this is the no no he just had a couple whiskeys just had a couple whiskeys <laughs> don't mind him near the end of the night uh keanu reeves we tip our cap to you thanks for making canada proud across the pond you can send us your positive reflection anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com or do what alan the farmer did and tag us on twitter or instagram coming up on tomorrow's show you're going where the hell is charles adler he's in transit today so chuck's going to join us tomorrow and this week we're also going to Hopefully, book a time with Scott Aitchison, the conservative candidate for leader of the federal party. We're going to be taking on stories over the next number of shows on water security. We're going to talk about that rage farming. You know, the Quebec election campaigns are kicking off. We'll take a look. Alberta and Quebec, some parallel storylines there. We'll dig into them. And of course, Katie Mack, astrophysicist on Thursday.
Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, Executive Producer Josh Dunford, Technical Producer John Hicks, General Manager Katie Cook Chivers, Account Coordinator Lawrence Durlego, Human Resources Lena Shepard, Website Design Mike Johnston, Voiceover by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Sapria Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandy Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a relay project. For more, check out ryanjasperson.com.